Okay, thank you. You can start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our How You Can Change the World with the Help of Physics, uh, which is an event from Founders for Schools held in partnership with the Institute of Physics as part of Role Model Week and on Ada Lovelace Day. Today, you are going to hear from two incredibly inspiring role models who have impressive and unique careers. By the end of this session, we're hoping that you'll have a better understanding of the amazing jobs that use physics and also why it is so important to everyday life. So for the audience at home, can I ask you to make sure your audio and video is turned off? Um, you can ask as many questions as you like using the chat function and we will put those questions to our speakers. Uh, we're also recording this session and it'll be featured on our YouTube channel. So enjoy the presentations, make some notes, ask all your burning questions, because we really hope that this session will help you make some informed decisions about your future career and from hearing from real people who use physics in their day-to-day -day lives. So before we get started, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Sue Charman Anderson. I'm the founder of Ada Lovelace Day, which is an international celebration of women's achievements in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Now, Ada Lovelace, you might have heard of, she was the first person to write and publish what we would today call a computer program back in 1843, believe it or not. She wrote a series of instructions to do some complicated maths on a mechanical computer that was called the analytical engine. But more importantly than that, she was also the first person to understand how important computers would become. And she predicted that one day they would be able to make music and art. And I am fairly sure that if Ada Lovelace were here today, she would absolutely love physics and computing. So now it is time for me to introduce our guests. We have uh, Raquel Velasco, Head of Product at Vivacity Labs, and we have Kimberly Lim, Systems Engineer at RAL Space. Thank you both of you for volunteering your time. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, Raquel and Kim are going to talk to us about their career journey, how they use physics, and then they will answer any questions that you have. But there are three poll questions that we would like you all to answer. So if you can find the poll section in Teams and you can give us your answer to our polls and then we will come back to those at the end of the session. So take a moment to find those polls and give us your answer. So it is time to introduce our fabulous speakers and we are going to start with Raquel. Welcome Raquel. Hi, Sue. Thank you. Hoping you can hear me okay. Can hear you perfectly. Great. So, Rebecca, can you talk us through, firstly, your job title? What does it mean? Um, and can you tell us a little bit about what you do, uh, a little bit about your career story? How did you get to where you are? Where did you start? And uh, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I appreciate the head of product is a very vague sort of job title and it's one that only really has existed for kind of the past like 10 years. Um, really what product is, it kind of came out of Silicon Valley, came out of software. And what we do is we're the bridge between the sales and the commercial side of the business and the customers and the research and development teams that actually build the technology. So my job is to make sure that our customers are kind of end users are really being heard and understood by the development teams that actually build the tools that we that we create. Um, so in terms of, I think I'll talk a little bit about my journey first, and then I've got a little presentation about kind of what we do at Vivacity and show you guys a little bit of uh, kind of what it is that, that, that we're doing with, with cities um, in the smart, smart city space. So um, to kind of begin with at school, so I, you know, you can tell by my accent, I wasn't you know, born in, in the UK, but I did grow up here. I, I moved to the UK when I was 16, um, went to, you know, to college in, in Nottingham and um, knew that I wanted to do sciences. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut since I was eight years old, um, was sort of inspired by John Glenn and realized um, well, what I wanted to do was sort of pursue a, a career in science. Um, and so what I decided to do was 
um, apply to study physics at university. Um, because just of all the different applications of physics and both engineering, but also pure mathematics, theoretical applied, I really wasn't sure kind of what direction I wanted my career to, to go in. So I thought that physics was broad enough to kind of open up a lot of doors. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, get a chance to study at Oxford University, um, where I, you know, spent four very tough but rewarding years um, studying physics. It was very, very theoretical, though, and I, I kind of quickly realized that academia wasn't going to be the place for me. Um, I liked working with bigger teams with a wider variety of people, solving kind of much more tangible problems than kind of what uh, academia and astrophysics was going to was going to give me. And so then I joined, um, after university, I joined an energy company um, and was doing research in geophysics. Um, so what I was doing was data analysis and visualization and trying to understand essentially how, how rocks break in the ground um, during, during drilling. Um, while that was um, fine for, in terms of lots of really interesting scientific problems to solve, ultimately um, not super fulfilling for me personally on sort of an ethical standpoint. And I was really looking to move into an area that was a bit more into green technology and more sustainable, looking to make a, a more tangible kind of positive impact on people's everyday lives. Um, I also at the same time realized that I wanted to generalize. Um, I kind of specialized quite a bit in this kind of narrow discipline of science um, and also kind of had a passion for, for business and for kind of taking that science and commercializing it and kind of exposing it to a wider audience. So I actually decided to do a business degree. I moved back to the UK, um, did my MBA in London. Um, and so after my business degree, I joined Vivacity. Um, so what we do, and I'll kind of try and bring up my, my video to explain what it is that we do. Um, give me one second. I'm hoping this will come through. Um, so what we do is we provide, we have these camera sensors that use AI um, to detect and track cars, bikes, pedestrians, any sort of road user. And we work with cities um, to help them improve transportation. And when I say improve transportation, I'm talking about making journeys for everybody faster, more efficient, but also safer and greener. Um, so really it kind of ticked all the boxes for what I was looking for. So something that was using deep science um, but also looking to kind of make that really positive, tangible impact on everyday sort of people's everyday lives. Um, I've really, so in terms of what physics does for my day-to-day -day job, one, I do a lot of data analysis on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of our clients, especially in the public sector, um, they just don't have a lot of time to look at this data and draw out kind of the most important key aspects. So I use a lot of the maths that I learned um, both at school and at university to work with them, to help them draw a lot of trends, help them understand what they're doing, but also it helps me conceptualize and sort of visualize what the data means. And so that foundation in physics has helped me translate the numbers into kind of real world outputs for, um, for cities more generally. So I've got one more little video that kind of shows the sort of safety element of what I was talking about. And one thing that you can sort of see in this one, and if it comes out well, is we're starting to do a bit of work at understanding um, near misses and seeing how cyclists and cars are interacting to understand if there are sort of like safety hotspots around different parts of the city. So some, some work that we're doing that's research work at the, at the moment, which I'm super excited about, um, is gonna be kind of hopefully really changing the way that cities sort of think about how the design works spaces um, in, the, in the coming years. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Fantastic, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, Kim, uh, would love to hear more about uh, what your job is and how you got here. Hi, yeah, so thank you for having me to talk today. Um, I think I have a presentation actually, so I, just because I like to see lots of pictures. Um, so we'll start there. Um, can you see that okay? Uh, present a view. Is that okay, can you see? Get my slides yeah perfect okay um so yeah so this is me <laughs> um well obviously not this is uh this is just an introduction slide um but basically ever since i was a, a small child um i i loved thinking about space i i i absolutely adored thinking about the universe and all the planets and and stars i would memorize facts about planets and and what was going on out there and, and i was fascinated by any kind of real world missions that I could find anything to do with space. Um, this is this is the high school I went to. 
um, is a comprehensive school. It, it wasn't a particularly enjoyable experience for me. I, I loved learning and I loved learning about phys physics, especially because it seemed to me to be. Sorry, Are oh, you yeah? I'm sharing the right screen? Because I'm uh, still seeing yours. Is, is it just me? I'm just seeing the, pre no, the first presentation slide. The slides aren't advancing. Oh, OK. Are you in presentation <laughs> mode? I, yeah. I can I can see the I can see space on the brain. That's the slide that I'm seeing. Oh, yeah. oh I'm not seeing that one. No, okay. <laughs> it might just mean me then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, okay. Well, it doesn't really matter about the slides anyway. Um, but yeah, the point was, I I went to a comprehensive state school. I none of no one in my family had ever been to university before. Um, but I loved my subject. I love physics so much that um, I kept on doing it. I kept on thinking about it, I kept on learning about it. Um, and eventually I went to university. Um, I, so I went to Imperial College in London. Um, this is a picture of me uh, playing with a, a cloud chamber on the on the left hand side there. And at the bottom, this was um, a, a summer project I got to do um, where I was I was playing with a, a magnetometer. So a, a tiny little cube uh, that goes up um, on satellites. Um, and and basically records what what the Earth's magnetic field is doing. Um, so I got to play with with lots of different things. It was really exciting, and and I really loved um, being at Imperial, um, and I loved it so much. I decided to stay on um, and uh, do a PhD. Um, so oh, and I also got to do some pretty other pretty cool things while I was there. So um, I got to go up to uh, Karuna. Um, which is a, a small uh, town just uh, north of the Arctic Circle, um, because it, because of my physics degree, uh, we went to learn about the physics of snow and also to learn about the aurora um, and kind of radiation around the Earth. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But while I was there, I got to go dog sledding and, and do all sorts of cool things like that. I think one one thing definitely to to take from from my journey is that. Physics has got me to go to some amazing places and do some things that I kind of never imagined I would do just purely because of being on a course or being part of a community and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, so as I was saying, I, I then went um, to go and do a PhD, um, this time at, at UCL um, and at the Mollard Space Science Laboratory. So there's a picture of it in the background and, and these people at the front here, so I'm, I'm right at the back. Um, these people at the front were, were the people that I, I studied with, so my, my supervisor is just in front of me there. Um, and these people became my friends over the kind of the, the three years that I was there and I had a great time. Um, you can see on the top left here, um, this kind of smudge in the background. Um, so this is actually a comet Hale-Bopp and it gives you a clue to what my PhD was in. So I studied um, the physics of comets and in particular how one special kind of comet tail um, was formed as it was going around the sun. And again, this got me to go to some pretty amazing places, um, one of which was um, up to La Palma, uh, the top of the mountain there. They have a telescope, um, which is this one called the Isaac Newton telescope. So I got to do some observing um, and kind of take my own pictures of, of comets and things that I'd, I'd love to see. Um, this, this picture on the, on the bottom right here, you can see um, it's actually above the clouds. So the observatory is so high up so that it doesn't have to worry about these kind of atmospheric effects. Um, so you can kind of look down from from the residence or from kind of where you sleep at night in the in the daytime, because obviously you're up at night taking the pictures um, and, and kind of see the clouds below you. Um, that was a really interesting trip, really exciting. Um, so I, I finished my PhD and I decided that um, I didn't want to stay in kind of an, an academic um, setting. Um, so I, I decided to sort of change track completely and go and and um, learn how to apply what I knew from being a physicist to doing engineering. Um, so I, I was really lucky I got a place um, on a graduate scheme at Surrey Satellites um, and I kind of worked my way up from from not knowing very much at all. But again, always having that kind of physics background to fall back on um, to, to basically um, provide me with this like logical framework so that I could understand what what different people were saying you know once I'd learned the language once I knew what they were talking about I could apply the principles that I already knew into this new setting um, and learn how to make satellites 
um, which was basically what what I learned to do here. So this this picture at the back here was from a course um, where we played with kind of diff different bits of a satellite. So these are kind of magnetorcas here that move the satellite around and that kind of thing. Um, and and SSTR was very keen on cake as well, which is also a passion I share. Um, so we had um, this was a cake to celebrate the the Galileo mission, um, which I was involved with. Um, which is um, Europe's version of, of GPS. So this is kind of how, how we um, track where, where we are on, on the Earth um, within Europe. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I really loved it. I, I, I um, loved changing career and, and learning all these new things. And I was really excited about actually, you know, being involved with putting things in space, not just taking pictures, or um, taking data from, from other people's missions, but actually working on those missions myself and putting things up there. Um, so my job is, is I'm a, a space systems engineer, um, which sounds like a, a kind of a, a strange thing. What do, what do you mean space systems? What does that mean? Well, in order to put something in space, you have a whole bunch of engineers with all with their own specialist disciplines. So you have mechanical engineers, you have thermal engineers, electrical engineers, software engineers, but there's all sorts of different other ones as well. And it depends on what mission you're working with as to what what's kind of important. Sometimes you'll have optical engineers, sometimes you'll have um, technicians and that kind of thing. But it, all of these people all have their own specialisms, all have their own thing that they really care about. And the job of a systems engineer is to go across all of those people and understand what they all mean, understand what is important to all of them, what's going on with the system as a whole, and make sure that we're producing something, we're building something together that will work and do what our customer wants it to do. So the systems engineer's job is to, to make sure that the overall mission meets its requirements. Um, and, and basically that's, that's what I've spent most of my time doing. Um, I love doing this uh, for space, especially because it's such an Im important field. Um, so we hear a lot more about kind of um, space tourism now, and we'll be we will be able to go up to space and and kind of um, look around and see what's going on. And we know about the International Space Station, and there is a lot of satellites around the Earth at the moment. Um, but there's there's two kind of main reasons that I like to think about why it's important to think about space. Um, and space technology, um, and and the first reason is is that that we live here. This this is this is our planet, the Earth. There's there's not there's no planet B, as people say, um, and and we need to make sure that we're we're taking care of it. We we also live in the solar system, right? So we have other planets nearby, and we have the sun to worry about as well. Sometimes it has these huge um, coronal mass ejections and things flying off the, the surface of the sun and we need to make sure we're safe here on earth and to do that we need to understand kind of what's going on um, but also we have to think about kind of space technology as well so sometimes technology that's in space has has a direct um implication on on things that's going on on earth so obviously you know your, your google maps and all of that you only have that in place because we have satellites flying around the earth telling us what's going on where different um where different things are and being able to, to map all of the surface. Um, but another thing that people don't often think about is that kind of space technology and, and, and how you make things that go up onto satellites and how you make them survive out there and how you uh, make things smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can put them on smaller rockets, which are cheaper. So then you can get more stuff into space and do more science and, and interesting engineering with it. Um, but in order to do all of that, you need to develop the technology that can make all of that work. And some of that technology gets reused, gets new life um, on Earth. And one of those examples is, is the, the chips that are in your smartphone. So things like the, your, um, your imaging detector, so the, the, the chips that are in your cameras were developed originally to go into space. That technology was developed for um, space missions and now it's being reused um, on Earth because we made it smaller and smaller. Yeah, I remember the camera used to be kind of quite a big chunky thing and now you can get it in the palm of your hand. Um, so that's why that's why we care about space and obviously I, I think it's very cool as well which is which was my re main reason for getting into it. So at the moment I'm working on kind of um, two space missions right now. So the, the first one is called um, Lagrange. Um, that's its current name. So it's an ESA mission, um, which is um, 
currently being developed and, and its name is kind of under review. So I think they have a kind of poll up at the moment. If anyone's interested in that, they have a, a cool idea for a mission name. Um, but basically the, the point of this mission is that it's going to sit um, just outside the Earth's orbit and stare off at the sun all the time. So remember these, these coronal mass ejection, these huge bursts of plasma and, and material coming off the sun um, that we were worried about. Um, this, this mission is actually going to measure those to detect them and see if there's any coming towards Earth. Um, and what I'm involved with um, from RAL Space's point of view is um, the, the instrument on the bottom left here. So this is a, an imager. It's basically two cameras. So there's one, one inside here and one on the top there. Um, and it's just going to take pictures all the time um, of the sun and see if there's anything blowing off that we should be worried about. Um, the other mission I'm working on um, is called um, the Prosper mission. Um, and this is kind of an, an ESA Russia collaboration. It's, it's an interesting one. Um, and this mission is going to go to the moon. Um, it's kind of one of the, the forerunners. Um, so it's one of the, the missions that is going to look to see what it would be like to have a base on the moon. So is there enough material? Is there enough water? Um, what are the rocks made of? That kind of thing. So Prosper is going to go up to the moon um, on a Russian rocket, um, on a lander, so it's going to land on the surface and drill down and take samples of what the moon is made of um, and then analyse them so to, to work out exactly what, what's in those samples. Um, and that should be able to tell us um, whether, you know, what we would need in order to get a base on the moon. Um, so I will stop sharing my slides there. Um, that was just a, kind of a, a quite brief overview of kind of how I got to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we have our first question. If you do have questions, please uh, visit the chat and uh, give us your question in the chat. We have a question from Liz Gwynn and I'm going to ask Raquel first. Um, how can we encourage girls who have that unfortunate experience at school of being questioned about why they like physics? So obviously um, showing girls the amazing things physics can do is a good start, but Raquel, what, what would you say um, helps to, to encourage girls to feel at home in physics? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, <laughs> I would definitely, I think it is definitely having more visible examples, not only, you know, for girls, but also for boys, of of, of women in in STEM fields, um, having that open dialogue about the challenges that women face in these as well. So I think making it very, um, you know, forming those allies across, you know, men and women, boys and girls, um, just making it super clear that um, there are these barriers and there are that everybody has their kind of role to play in in doing that. Um, one of the things that I strongly believe in, especially in sort of, you know, I, I don't love the, the use of the word minority for women since we are you know, not minority, but minority in STEM, unfortunately, um, is that people who are the minority shouldn't have to kind of always be advocating for themselves. So how do we empower um, boys as well to, to sort of promote the, the women around them? So it's, it's basically really about not encouraging girls, but also helping, um, boys understand some of the challenges that, that women face in this area to speak up. Absolutely. Kim, what would you say? <laughs> That's really hard to follow that answer. Um, but I, I would say um, I, I really struggled when I, when I was a kid uh, because I didn't have a lot of female um, role models um, and there wasn't really an understanding of, of all of the cool things you can do with a physics degree and kind of even even if you're doing apprenticeships and things like that um, I think people don't realize how many jobs there are out there I think you know even even just the jobs that were available to your parents are completely different to, to what's available to you now there's there's so many different options and so many different things you can try um, and just because you've never done something like that before doesn't mean that you wouldn't be great at it. Um, and I think sometimes it's it's just kind of worth having a go. And actually, you know, one of the things that I find with physics is that the people who are really good at it um, are also the ones that are really good at people as well. So it, it's not just a kind of abstract topic of kind of like logic and, um, you know, drilling things down and, and 
equations and code and all of that stuff all, all of that has its place but actually it's about how you interact with people how how you bring people together to a for a project how you um get everybody on the same page and get everybody working towards the same goals and i think these are things that you know traditionally we associate with women and and you know they're really important jobs and i'm not saying that women aren't great at the, the math and the coding and stuff as well because you know clearly from the people on this call and from many women that i've worked with that that is not true but i think it, it's a it's a trying to give people a broader understanding of what physics is what science is and what it means to society because everybody's got a place in that somewhere um, regardless of, of gender or, or sex or, or anything absolutely um i want to try and squeeze one very quick last question in which is um, so I studied geology. Um, it was fascinating. There were parts of it I found quite difficult. So what do you say to um, the people watching who enjoy their STEM subjects but do find parts of it hard? How do you get over that, oh gosh, you know, this is a bit tricky stage? Raquel? Um... I, I think it's obviously it's very personal. So for me, it was finding the way that you engage with the topic best. Um, I'm very, I'm very concrete. So for me, it was always, okay, can I find one example that I find, you know, that I can solve one, you know, oftentimes in physics and a lot of, a lot of subjects, they start really broad and these really abstract concepts and abstract is so hard to grasp. Um, and so I would sort of encourage people to really nail one really specific example and understand that one well. If everything else goes to the side, if you can really understand that little piece well, everything else will start to fall into place. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, don't try and tackle it all in one big go. Just really one tangible thing that you're like, okay, I can, this one I get, the rest will fall into place. Fantastic. And very quickly, Kim. Yeah, I, I think um, Raquel's right. I, and just kind of take your time with it. Like you don't have to understand, you don't have to be able to do everything right now. Everybody has a, is on a path, right? We're, we're all on this learning curve um, and, and it takes some people a different amount of times for others. That's not anything wrong with them. That's just they're, they're on a, a different route and that's fine. Um, I think you, sometimes you, you need to have that self-belief and that's very hard to develop if you're kind of struggling with what you want to do and, and kind of where you want to go. But I think if you if you really want to do something, there is usually a way to do it. Um, so so try talk to someone else. See if there's someone else who's got a different perspective, who's got a different understanding of that problem. See if that helps you. Um, just don't assume that because somebody's explained something in one particular way that you'll never understand it and that's it. You, you're just dumb and that's it. It might be that there's a better way of understanding it or there's a way that makes more sense to you and you've just got to keep going until you until you find that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are starting to very much run out of time. So if you could go to the chat again, we have uh, the end of session polls. So please give us your answer to those questions. Um, so thank you both to Raquel and Kim. This has been uh, far too short and very, very interesting. Um, and I'd like to thank the Institute of Physics for holding this session along with Founders for Schools. So it is now time I need to pass over to Georgina Phillips from the Institute of Physics to wrap up today's session. Thank you, Georgina. Uh, yeah, I'd just love to say thank you to everyone who's joined today. It's been really exciting to hear so many people were joining and thanks so much for Sisu for doing uh, the chairing and also just for founding Ada Lovelace Day. What a great idea that was. Um, and um, yeah, and thanks so much, uh, Kim and Raquel. I now know what a systems engineer and a head of product is, which I didn't know this morning. So I'm I'm done a little bit better for this. And I just wanted to say, um, this was exactly the kind of event we love. Um, I work on the Limitless campaign, which is uh, a piece of work the Institute of Physics is doing, which is all about the idea that anyone can do physics and physics is for everyone and we're working to help um, lots of groups that currently don't do as much physics which include girls um, also uh, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds black caribbean young people are underrepresented in physics lgbt young people and disabled young people so we're doing a big project to try and get more and more people interested um, i'll share a link in the chat just for anyone who's interested in that and um, we have been um, put, working with YouTube on putting together some exciting videos. Um, Earth and Space has been mentioned quite a lot today, and 
um that's the uh the playlist we've got there so i'll share those too but yes just a massive thanks to to everyone um here today and um hope hope we can do we can see do some more events like this soon fantastic thank you georgina so um just to wrap up um you will be all emailed a survey form from founders for school so please fill that in so they can continue to improve their service and look out for the recording of this session and there are lots of other videos on the founders for school youtube channel at founders for schools if you aren't already following them then i recommend that you do they're on twitter facebook linkedin and instagram and you can also keep an eye out there for more events coming up and of course you can always arrange your own event for your schools by using the founders for schools website thank you all thank you raquel thank you kim thank you georgina um really appreciate your time today and thank you everyone for coming i hope that you have found this uh, an insightful and interesting conversation. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks.